It's amazing how much life and activity there is going on out there at night when most of us are home watching television. Oh. Kathy McCormick is going out for an evening stroll in the suburbs. But tonight, she's gearing up for an important watch program, checking on the welfare of some neighborhood residents. Mm. Tonight, Kathy is looking out for frogs and toads in the creek just behind her house as a volunteer of the Texas Amphibian Watch Program. It's a way for citizens to get involved in monitoring the frogs and toads in their neighborhood. Tonight, I'm going to be doing my monitoring of Honey Bear Creek. I just walk out the back door and listen and record how many species of frogs and toads you hear calling and provide that data into uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. The water level, I would say, is average. Sky is cloudy. And the background noise is medium. After collecting some basic information, amphibian watchers don't so much watch as listen. And wait. Well, we've been out here for half an hour, and uh, no frogs calling so far on this very cold night. The weather is very changeable in the spring. It doesn't look like there's going to be any frogs out tonight. This creek is quiet because of a late cold snap. But globally, amphibian populations are falling silent for other reasons. It all started back in 1989 when scientists at a conference started comparing notes and finding out that they were seeing declines in amphibians in many different localities, but really alarming decreases in amphibian populations. And then we added to this in the mid-1990s populations of frogs that seemed to have a really alarming rate of malformations, things like extra legs or extra eyes or missing limbs. And so together, those sort of indicators made us wonder if something was going on globally, some sort of broad environmental change that was affecting our amphibians. Well, nobody really knows, and the basic problem is, is that there's uh, no baseline data. In other words, there's no data for for most of these amphibians prior to when people started to notice problems. We want to know how frogs and toads in Texas are doing and what kind of factors might be causing their decline. So I think it's really valuable research. For biology professor Ben Pierce, Texas Amphibian Watch provides important data about amphibian health while giving his students an opportunity to do real field work. They're doing this just to get some experience doing research, uh, and we're interested in being involved in this particular project. <laughs> and they spend a considerable amount of time on this. We go out one night a week, and it takes basically from 7 until midnight, and they also have to learn all these frog calls. So after the rest of their campus has settled down for the night, Ben and his students are just getting started, hitting the road to listen at rural wetlands for frogs and toads. It's a great way to sample the environment for the presence of frogs. Texas Parks and Wildlife provides a randomly selected route, and uh, we stop at wetlands where frogs might be present. All right. We take a lot of precautions to be safe when we stop. Don't get on private property, but uh, many of these frog calls you can hear a considerable distance away. And uh, we listen for five minutes and record any frog calls we hear, and also the approximate number of frogs that are calling. Okay, that's our five minutes. We have 10 stops on this route. So we'll go to the next stop. I just don't think there's much out here tonight. Hopefully we'll be able to hear more in the next few stops. Frogs and toads tend to be fairly secretive animals. They're really obvious only during the, uh, the spring and summer when most of them breed. And the rest of the year, they're, they're pretty hidden from view. The male frogs and toads are actually the ones that do the calling. And when conditions are right, when temperatures are right, and rainfall or humidity has been right, the male frog or toad will go to a wetland, and those males will congregate and start to emit a call that's unique to that particular species. 
trying to attract the females to come to the pond or the, the puddle and hoping then that the female will come and the males will have the chance to fertilize the female's eggs when they are laid. In Texas, there are about 30 species of salamanders and about 40 species of frogs and toads. So we really have a rich uh, diversity of amphibians in the state. For many of these species, we have very little information about how abundant they are and how they naturally increase or decrease over time. And so it's really difficult to know what kinds of things might be causing decreases in amphibians. There's lots of ideas, but there's no one single factor. But it seems to be that it's interaction of complex things where maybe the habitat is changing, the climate is changing, and amphibians are kind of suffering the consequences. Amphibians have a very permeable skin, and so many people have speculated that they may be particularly good indicators of environmental damage. There's the problem with the ultraviolet radiation, indication that some chemicals are having effects on some populations. Habitat, of course, is, a, is an issue. But again, you can't draw any conclusions without some data. You can just tell us if you find gray tree frogs that it was a gray tree frog species. But, but each year, more and more amphibian watchers learn how to collect species. that data. This is the Cope's gray tree frog. We've got training sessions or workshops. We've got a CD. People have heard frog and toad sounds, but perhaps they never knew what they were hearing at night. So the CD can help with that. The northern cricket frog, Acris crepitans. Now with Texas Amphibian Watch, we've got about 150 different sampling sites. And so when data comes in from points like that all over the state, we're able to get a, a pretty nice picture of what's going on. Well, definitely over there, you can hear about maybe two to three northern cricket frogs. Later that night, the roadside survey gets hopping. Yeah, that's probably southern leopard frog. That down there, I'm pretty sure, was a bullfrog. We heard cricket frogs at almost every stop, and we've heard leopard frogs at the last, what, three that's or four three. stops. I so, think so. Uh, we heard actually quite a few frogs out tonight. No, Ooh. there he was. Not anymore. I think that was the one that was a leopard frog, I think. Well, we actually got to see some frogs. That was good. Whether from roadside counts, adopting backyard ponds or creeks, or reporting amphibian That's sightings and malformations. Green tree frog. That's the information the Texas here. amphibian Answer. watchers collect will ultimately benefit frogs and toads ah, everywhere. bullfrog. <laughs> the Houston toad is considered to be endangered, primarily, we think, due to loss of habitat over time. We know we've lost one frog species. The northern leopard frog used to occur on the very edge of Texas, out in El Paso County. But the initial news for most Texas amphibians could be worse. We know some of them are in habitats that are threatened, like some of our spring-dwelling salamanders. But uh, we don't see the alarming trends we've seen in some places around the world. You know, they've been busy. And the trend of concerned citizens like Kathy McCormick Look looking out for wildlife is very encouraging. There's a whole bunch of them right here. I think these are northern cricket frog tadpoles, because they're very little. And a Rio Grande leopard frog tadpole. He just wiggled. Woo, look at them all. We really value the extra eyes and ears. And, now look at that. and volunteer yeah. eyes and ears are assisting in other citizen monitoring programs. I think this is really fun. I think it's very interesting. Texas nature trackers keep tabs on freshwater mussels, horned lizards, monarch butterflies, and many other animals in addition to amphibians. I think that we have a moral obligation to preserve for future generations some of what's wild and natural within the state. We have to be cognizant of their susceptibility to declines. I think we have to really work at making sure that we provide the habitats that support them. But I am hopeful about frogs. I think that my grandchildren will one day get to go out and listen to the same frogs that I hear today. That's my hope anyway.